والآن نبدأ الجلسة الختامية في هذا الم... هذه القمة آه وإن شاء الله يكون ختامها مسك آه وحابب أذكركم كلكم اللي إحنا عندنا الكلوزنج سيشن دايركتلي بعد البانل فكل الناس تفضل في مكانها وحتى كل الشباب اللي شايفيننا فوق في الإكزيبيشن بعد ما نخلص البانل دي كله يكون موجود في الكلوزنج سيشن إن شاء الله علشان هنعلن على مبادرات تهم كل رواد الأعمال في الوطن العربي والآن نبدأ في جلسة Opportunities Know How How to Create Opportunities for SMEs and Disruptive Technologies and Digitization هنسمع أفكار جديدة إحنا سمعنا الصبح Inspirational Panel على Businesses و Terminologies طب دلوقتي عايزين نعرف إزاي ننقل الواقع ده على الأرض في الوطن العربي مهاب The floor is yours Thank you very much, Karim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Muhab Anis. I'm a professor at the American University in Cairo, and I'm also the CEO of Innovity. It's an innovation management consultancy where we've been doing work over the past 15 years, and I'm very happy to be with you today and with the distinguished panelists to talk to you a little bit about some of the emerging technologies that are really reshaping the kind of products, services, and business models that we are presently consuming. So in particular, this approach creates a huge amount of opportunities for SMEs. Whether you're looking at emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, blockchain, virtual reality, augmented reality, all these different technologies create many opportunities across multiple industries to reshape the world that we live. So I'm very happy that we have a distinguished panelists with us to talk to us a little bit about what are these technologies? How can we actually benefit from these technologies? What are the risks associated with these technologies? And what can we, as SMEs, as policymakers, do in the next two, three years in order to capitalize and to leverage on some of these emerging technologies? So let me first introduce our uh, panelists. I'm very happy that we have Rudy uh, Shushani with us. Rudy is the founder of Crypto Talks and DX Talks, and he's an international technology consultant. Very happy to have Asha Easton. She is an immersed lead at Innovate KTN UK Network and a co-founder of the Extended Reality Diversity Initiative. And very happy to welcome Emmanuel Gani. She is the MSMEs and blockchain lead at the World Trade Organization. Unfortunately, Kevia Perleman, who is our fourth panelist, was not able to come today. So we're gonna, with this, this actually would allow us to have even more time to answer some of your questions. Okay, so let me actually start with, uh, with Rudy. Rudy, you are a, a digital transformation strategist. You've worked in this area for a very long time around different technologies such as Web 3.0, blockchain, and also related to some of, and also going into the cryptocurrency uh, domain. I wonder if you can highlight a little bit about what really Web 3.0 is. What are the different type of applications that you can actually utilize using this kind of technology? And what are the specific opportunities that you think SMEs here in the Arab world can benefit from when they try to develop products and solutions related to Web 3.0? So Rudy, please, uh, if you can uh, share this experience with us. So uh, that's your stuff. So I want to thank first uh, the organizers, of course, uh, the hard work that they've done, Karim and Joel and the other teams and the hidden soldiers behind all of this. So let's go back to our uh, topic and actually our question is uh, the Web3 aspect. So I'm um, going to skip this. Can I have a microphone, please, if, uh, on the stage, if you don't mind, meanwhile? Can we have a microphone on the stage, please, handheld microphone, if you don't mind? Anyhow. 
So let me start here. Who knows what's the metaverse? Can I see hands? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So that makes maybe 2%, 3%, 5%. So who knows what's Web 3.0? Almost the same number of hands, right? What about the rest? And today, that's my question. What about 80, 90% of the other people that really don't know? And whatever I will explain, you will still not know. So I'm kind of assuring you, you have to go back and research about this trending topic, about how and what are the elements. I will try to give you pinpoints, of course, but there's a lot of things that you need to take care in between. So the big question is, why are we talking about the metaverse, blockchain, Web3? We're here to answer that. But before I answer that, yesterday was the 14th anniversary of the blockchain creation by an unknown person called Satoshi Nakamoto that actually changed how we think about everything today. And with that, now banking, finance, governments, everybody is inspired to change in this new revolution. Sometimes it's too advanced for us at this point of time, but we should be able to start tapping into this. This is a Bitcoin. Who knows what's this? I mentioned it, but who knows what's the value of this today? So I asked a question earlier on, who knows about Web3, blockchain, and metaverse? I received maybe 5 10%. Who knows what's Bitcoin? Exactly. So one way or, or another, we know what's the application, because that was the first application, which was Bitcoin. And who wants a Bitcoin? You're the first hand. <laughs> you get one. That's actually the lady, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, so I have another one. Who wants another one? Here we go. <laughs> this time for the... Why do you want the Bitcoin? Let me do that. I wanted to be a rich woman. So the monetary value that she answered, is this what she wants? But it's actually way beyond, and this is where we all start on the monetary value. We want to become richer. But it's actually way beyond of this. It's about the technology. It's about the technology that we are building. I started as a trader in 2016, but then I got interested in the technology aspect of this. So how can we really start venturing into this? If you look at the definition of a metaverse, and I'm thankful for the panel that was before me, and I'm very specific, thankful for Joel, of what he explained. And this guy, actually, you should follow him, because really, he's an inspiration leader. He mentioned a lot of futuristic things. Some of us will question, are we there yet? Some of us will question, are we dreaming? Is it a trend? Do we need to go there? Is it too advanced for us? So those are really critical questions, and I'll tell you why. Let's understand a little bit about Web1, because that's the core of my presentation. Web1, I think we all know it, is actually was simply put a username and a password where the internet was, we were only consuming the internet. Then in around 2004, 2005, and this came organic, it wasn't planned. We started seeing Web2.0, which was about read, and write. So this is where we started seeing more projects, more writing content similar to Facebook, YouTube, and so on and so on. But with Web 2.0, there was something missing. Our identity, our privacy, and the abuse of our data, for them to monetize it, 
and for us to give it for free. And this is where Web3 comes in. Web3 give us the option of eliminating all of those. You cannot tap into our data without prior authorization. You cannot tap into our data without us allowing you. And most importantly, it's built on something called a blockchain. Was it private or public? So the data is written publicly. You can inquire it, view it, transact on it, or even on a private. And believe me, private blockchain is one of the things that you should all follow and try to implement. Even going on a public ledger or a public thing is, is something very dear to my heart, but is as important also on a private blockchain. Because if you think how will the transformation happens towards the future, it's going to be on the blockchain. And if we look at the region, I'm going to give a couple of examples. We're going to see why it was built on the blockchain and what are the elements. So it's right for censorship, right for privacy, and right for security. And all of this is really amazing. And one more thing blockchain gave us in humanity is something called decentralized. I'll explain it a little bit now and I'll explain it later. Decentralized or permissionless is we can own the internet. We can own our application. Nobody can shut it down. Nobody can interfere in it. Nobody can play with it. And this is where humanity was given another option. Because before that, you had to go to Google, Facebook, or any other platforms and be under the influence or under the regulation of uh, the operators. Of course, with decentralizations, there's ethics, there's a lot of there's security, there's a lot of things that we have to take into consideration. It's not a forest. But now we have more power as humanity again. So in some of political regimes or whatever, now we were giving something also extra value. Did we miss the train or the bus? And that's a question for us. So the technology has been here for 14 years. I hear some questions. We missed the train. We missed the bus. We missed the technology. And let me give you two examples. Artificial intelligence started in the 1950s. 70 years later, it took the booming of it. We're just talking now for the last five, seven years. AI is really a hype. This is only 14 years old, so it's still a baby. There's a lot of innovation that can go into it. But we have a unique chance as an Arab region. First, on the decentralization. And secondly, it's happening not just today. We can always do innovation. And we can today tap into this. This is our chance. And this is, again, cross-border. It's not about if we are today in Jordan, it's not about Jordan. If we are in the Gulf, it's not about the Gulf. It goes way beyond. So we can all be tapping into this and not missing the opportunity. But what do we need? First, the will. That's, I think, one of the hardest things to get is the will. We don't know sometimes we want to change. And we don't know sometimes this is what we want. And sometimes we're in, sitting in our comfort zone and we blame policies and legislations. But we want to change. And with that, you have to add education for a cultural change for the people to follow. And third thing is any entrepreneur that has the will, little bit of education and internet, of course there's other things, can actually tap into this technology. From developer perspective, from company perspective, from entrepreneur, from you name it, today you can create something in the blockchain. Something is trying to solve a problem. A problem maybe in our daily lives. And we've seen Abdul Rahman earlier on, that was one of the good examples. How, can, how many Abdul Rahman can we have? Why did he venture into this? 
Somebody asked him, what was your success? How did you, how can we learn from this? But we first, we need to start before getting into there. We need to understand what's the market, what's the gap. So how can we as an Arab nation and Arab SMEs start into this? And I really benefit. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what are the elements and opportunities for all of you to tap into. First, it's the infrastructure. Some will argue that infrastructure, we're not made to create infrastructure in terms of uh, electronics and whatsoever. <laughs> There's a lot of good examples in the region that are tapping not just into the blockchain, but tapping into the big telecom uh, aspect or big cybersecurity or anything. So we have some of the talents available. Developers and development. How many here is a, I would say, let's, let's start with this. How many here is a developer? Yeah. If you just add to your uh, resume or your CV that you are a smart contract or blockchain developer, I promise you, you will be having a lot of opportunities. And there was another initiative in the UAE for one billion or one million, something like that, if I'm not mistaken, Arab developers. So why is this important? Okay. Applications, there's a lot of applications that we need to create to empower this. Data, and today we are selling our data for zero cost. We're just a pipeline towards whatever you wanna call it, the east or the west. How can we maintain our data? How can we generate data for us? <coughs> And between the application and data, how we can create local applications that are locally developed for the local regions that can go global. And lastly, we need the innovation part. How can we really innovate to create? And to think outside the box, what does the world need? Rudy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Quickly, two uh, slides. So first, we have the remote power that we have, that today we can work remotely. You don't need any more to be located outside. You don't need to immigrate or migrate to another region. We have that power. All you need, again, laptop, internet, and some good ideas. And again, this is permissionless. You don't need permission to do it. You just have to innovate. Those are the elements. And we're talking about protocol layers. We're talking about infrastructure, access to Web3, was it wallets, and so on. Who has a digital wallet? So those are the elements of Web3, and this is what we need to empower more and create more in our region, focused on all of those elements. Those are the applications that are many, and there are maybe 10 other slides similar to this with more applications and more applications that are being built. Every day I'm bombarded. I have my uh, talk show called Crypto Talks Wednesdays, every Wednesday at 7.30 Dubai time. And then I get asked every week, do you know this application? And my answer is no. And I'm researching on weekly basis and daily basis. So this is a world of opportunities. And it's empowering the future of digital economy, especially now we are talking about digital ministry. How can this be tapping into the next generation and empowering the next generation? How can governments do legislation to empower this better internal collaboration, digital transformation, full automation, uh, empowering the new creator economy, because today we are creator economy, but we don't know it, we don't tap into it. We think only the TikTokers or the YouTubers are the, the, are the uh, creator economy. No, it's way beyond. And access to finance, policies for entrepreneurs, and of course, empowering remote uh, working. And this is one application. I attended my first university course in the metaverse three weeks ago in University of Nicosia. They are the leaders in this region. They saw there's a gap and then they went into it and they opened the first course only three weeks ago. That was innovation, yes, of course. It was interactive. There was somebody uh, questioning the previous panel about education in a gamifying way or maybe metaverse. So this is your answer. Can we replicate this into our universities? Can we issue our digital certificates and diplomas on blockchain using Web3? We can. 
That's easy. You don't need any permission for this. In the end of the day, it's an application on a blockchain. But traceability, same as Abdul Rahman, traceability is very powerful. That's the first case I think everybody should venture in. Thank you. And look at Dubai. They want five times their uh, objectives and 40,000 jobs. And 40,000 jobs, not just for Dubai, it's for the region. Look at the numbers. They want to increase 20% of their GDP in 2031. And are they dreaming? Possibly. Will they do it? Also possibly. We don't know what's the, actually the future, even on the metaverse, on the blockchain. I sat down with Google engineers. I sat down with Facebook engineers. They don't know. <coughs> they said they need 10 years to figure it out. Look at the numbers of stock market of Facebook. It dropped down $80 billion. So am I dreaming too much? Possibly, yes. But can we do something in this global economy also? Why not? It's not a trend. It's something that is available, but we need to tap into it. So this is the biggest question for all of you. What is your next move? And with that, I'd like to thank you. OK, great. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Rudy, for this uh, very comprehensive uh, talk and uh, again thank you for walking us through the kind of evolution that took place from you know web 1 web 2 web 3 talking about some of the applications that some of the SMEs are actually developing and you actually mentioned something quite interesting the, the re when you start talking about web 3.0 and the kind of data that gets transmitted you, we start talking about privacy considerations we start talking about ethical considerations with related to youth and children that are using metaverse applications so i'll get back to you on that uh, on that part but be, but uh, until then i want to ask actually asha to tell us another type of emerging technology other than the metaverse part and the web 3.0, which is the extended reality part, the related to augmented reality and virtual reality. They are, there are uh, uh, touching points between those two technologies and between web 3.0. But I want you to shed a little bit more light about the extended reality. How is it reshaping some of the products and services that we are consuming and how can SMEs take value or leverage on this kind of technology, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's my presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, there we go. All right, well, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really uh, appreciative to be here. It's been a great conference so far. Uh, thank you to Rudy and the panel before for doing all the heavy lifting on uh, defining the metaverse and, and Web3. Um, as was mentioned, I'm more of a XR perspective on all of this, and I'm gonna be speaking more around the XR ecosystem, specifically in the UK, how we've set it up, um, the innovation ecosystem there and um, how, we, how we make it work. So just by a show of hands out of curiosity, how many SMEs are in the room? SMEs, yeah. yeah, okay. And how many people in the room would consider themselves like innovation ecosystem builders for their countries? Okay, cool. So um, I'm gonna give you a, a bit of background on Immerse UK, who we are, what we do, um, and how we've grown um, the landscape in our country. So we are the UK government's innovation network for immersive technology professionals. We were set up in 2016 as a part of another organization, a larger parent organization called Innovate UK KTN. And we're supported by Innovate UK, which is the part of the UK government that does um, R&D grant funding uh, for all businesses across uh, every industry. And um, we're a cross-sector network, and our goal is to uh, connect businesses and research organizations um, across the XR and metaverse ecosystems. And when we talk about the metaverse, I know we've, you know, there's a lot of de definitions that have been going around. The metaverse, as we know, it does not exist yet, just as a, uh, you know, just to, don't, don't feel bad if it's a, a term that's confusing at the moment, but it'll be the kind of collaboration between the merging of immersive technologies with blockchain and these other technologies that will enable it to happen. So we do, you know, uh, also try to drive those uh, 
technologies as well and bring them into our ecosystem that we currently have. So our goal is to really position the UK as a, a leader in, in immersive technologies. So this is just a snapshot of who's involved in our organization. We, as I said, we're cross sector, so we have lots of representation from the creative industries and other industries as well, and work with all of the major kind of uh, hardware players like Pico and Meta, uh, Microsoft, et cetera. And when I say we're part of a bigger organization, this is Innovate UK KTN. So this is an innovation arm of the government that works to facilitate cross-sector innovation across all industries. And, and it's driven by the five pillars of their, um, their strategy around net zero, diversity and inclusion, uh, global innovation, innovation adoption, diffusion, and place-based innovation. This is just a snapshot of kind of the cross-sector expertise that exists in the organization. Um, and Immerse UK as like a separate network that works within this wider ecosystem. We work to help facilitate with those sector specific teams around innovation around XR. So how does XR implement into manufacturing, into health, into um, kind of any of these, these spaces. So to do that, we kind of bridge the gap between private organizations, SMEs, large corporates, academics, um, and the government, and we work at a, a national level, regional, um, and international level. So nationally, that involves you know showcasing all the work that is being done in the UK. Um, we deliver you know help to deliver national uh, funding programs, including a large program called Audience of the Future that invested 33 million pounds into developing the XR ecosystem um, over the last couple of years. We work at a regional level, to, and, sorry, and on a national level, we also produce um, the kind of industry reports that kind of look at the sector as a whole on a yearly basis. Um, at a regional level, we work as much as possible to highlight all the work going on specifically in the different uh, innovation hubs in the country and uh, promote investment outside of London, which is where most, most investment happens and where the majority of immersive tech companies uh, reside. And then we work at an international level as well, particularly with the international team within Innovate UK KTN, to kind of be a, a, a gateway to any businesses uh, or other organizations that want to come work in the UK uh, to give them kind of an overview of the landscape. We help them to understand uh, how it all works. Um, we also work with uh, aligning all the kind of UK government organizations that are doing any international work, work around immersive so that they're all communicating with each other and aligning their strategies. And we help to organize um, uh, international trade missions um, for the UK to various countries specifically around um, immersive tech and we've done that so far in China, South Korea, um, we did one to Japan this year and we've done them to the west coast of the US so far. Um, and then this is just an example of the latest immersive economy report that we just produced. Um, it just came out a couple of weeks ago. It's got a lot of great more in-depth information um, about the, the state of the industry uh, right now, and it is UK focused, but I think there are some interesting parts about it that I think are, are relevant for this talk. And I was told I only had five minutes, five to seven minutes, so that's why I've kind of kept this presentation very brief, but you can get all the kind of like detailed information about what was in it. We kind of look at the state of the nation. Um, we break down all of the uh, ge geographies of the country and kind of where the innovation hubs are. We look at the sector application growth areas and which sectors are growing the fastest. Healthcare is, is actually the one that is growing the fastest right now. Um, we did a uh, kind of a section on the metaverse, what it is and what, how it applies to immersive technologies and, and um, what, what it could be in the future. Um, and then we've looked at, and I think this is probably would be interesting for anyone here who's working on innovate, you know, innovation ecosystems in their countries, if you want to do something specific around immersive technologies, um, it looks at the success of the R&D funding programs that have happened over the last few years that are kind of coming to, they're wrapping up and coming to a close in the UK um, and what they've done and how they've functioned to drive the immersive tech ecosystem in our country. So it's been very successful um, and I think that's kind of a really interesting part of the report that might be relevant to people in this room. Um, but I think overall, you know, the question is, you know, why is this important uh, for the Arab region? Why is it something that SMEs should be paying attention to and, and just governments in the region in general? Um, I think 
you know, Rudy just made all the really great points about how, you know, major corporations defining their metaverse strategies, despite Facebook losing <laughs> billions of dollars, it is still, uh, you know, their key, their key focus, um, and they're not deviating from that. Um, and, you know, governments, as you mentioned, bringing on um, metaverse strategies, um, and that's just becoming more and more widespread. So this is definitely not something that should be ignored. Um, and another thing in the report that we noticed is that the highest levels of investment, private investment, have happened in the sector uh, this past year and are projected for, projected for 2022 to exceed um, investment trends. So there's a lot of uh, great uh, you know, enthusiasm for the space, uh, and I think that there's a, a major opportunity for, for, for this region to become you know, a really strong player. So, if you are interested in um, developing something like this, if you're interested in understanding more about how to create an ecosystem that can, can help this to grow uh, in this particular uh, technology sector in, in this region, then reach out. You know, we're always looking to collaborate. We're always looking you know, to share knowledge. So um, we'd really love to uh, work with more of you. I've been really excited by what we've you know, seen so far at the conference. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aisha. And I think one of the things that you mentioned in your, um, in your speech that you were talking about these, that you need cross-sector expertise, which highlights that you know, these kind of extended reality, augmented reality, virtual reality applications and technologies, they can actually create value to you know, healthcare sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, and so forth. And, the, and this is a very important point because a lot of the SMEs that are in this room, they actually wor are working on different type of industries. And I think this would be an, an opportunity for them to perhaps see, speak to you after this uh, panel to see how they can actually collaborate. And also the ecosystem enablers, how they can actually collaborate with your organization to enrich what they do. Okay, very fantastic. So uh, let me actually, you know, hide, sp be specific about one of the technologies that is kind of uh, creating a lot of dominating uh, factors in the Web 3.0 applications and the different type of technologies, which is blockchain. And for me, blockchain, I didn't really understand what it was at the, at the beginning. And then every time I read a little bit more, I find that the kind of applications are pretty diverse. Even when we talk about things like world trade, effectively, I actually was reading your book, uh, Emmanuel, about how actually blockchain can actually be a technology that can facilitate world trade. And for me, that was actually quite fascinating. And I, I would actually like to invite you to tell us about how, how can you actually do this? Try now. Does working work now? Yes, yes. Yes. There we go. Okay, technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much first uh, for uh, organizing these very forward-looking panels, um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, there will be a lot of uh, new ideas and, and food for thought. Now, let me dive into blockchain. As you said, uh, we've talked about blockchain in the context of the metaverse in uh, in the previous session and earlier in this session, uh, but blockchain is uh, certainly much more than the metaverse. It's much more than that Bitcoin, and uh, it's it has, in fact, as you were saying, many applications in international trade. It can make international trade more efficient, more inclusive, help the participation of small businesses in international trade. And this is really what I want to, to focus on. How can it help alleviate some of the key challenges that we face in international trade, which is the fact that there are many different actors involved, um, that the processes are still very paper intensive, uh, there are about 4 billion paper documents that are being shipped every year, um, that there is very low visibility into supply chain, and there is also a big problem in terms of access to, to finance, in particular trade finance, with a big trade finance gap that significantly impacts and affects small businesses. It has been estimated by the Asian Development Bank at 1.7 trillion. It has actually increased because of the pandemic. It was 1.5 trillion uh, a few years ago. So we have these key challenges that have been exacerbated by the, the current pandemic. Uh, so how can blockchain help? It can actually have many different applications when it comes to international trade. But before I dive into this, I just would like to get an idea, as you were saying, uh, it's, it's difficult to know what blockchain is. Uh, we talk a lot about it, but 
how many of you know specifically what, what blockchain is, what the technology is? And I'm not talking about Bitcoin there. Blockchain? I, I see, yeah. yeah. Okay, I see a few hands, but not that many. So let me start maybe with what it is, so that you understand how it can then transform international trade. Um, we use the term blockchain in a generic way very often, like I'm currently doing actually, um, but we should be talking really about distributed ledger technologies, uh, blockchain being only one type of distributed ledger technologies. But let me use blockchain because it's easier and, and more catchy as a term. Now what is it? It's a, a ledger uh, that is decentralized, as uh, Ruby was saying, so there is no central entity that can control it. It's distributed, meaning that each node or each computer that is connected to the network has a copy of the transactions. The transactions are added to the ledger in a permanent and near inalterable way, so they are tamper-proof uh, because of the use of advanced cryptographic techniques. And what is very interesting is that the transactions are timestamped and linked to one another, which allows for traceability, for example, along the entire supply chain, so you can trace products along the supply chain. And we heard a very interesting example in the previous panel. Uh, Adel Abderrahman was talking about Decapolis and what he does with uh, olive oil. Uh, it can also allow to trace documents along the entire supply chain. So traceability, uh, as Ruby was saying, is certainly one of the most powerful use cases uh, for blockchain in international trade. It allows you to track products along the entire supply chain to determine the origin, provenance of these products, make sure that they haven't been altered, uh, know who has done what, when, um, and so it creates trust for consumers, of course, but it can also make it easier for companies, for example, to fight fraud, and there are actually quite a few um, use cases in, in that space, including uh, uh, luxury brands like LVMH, for example. It can uh, allow to track tainted products, very quickly, so you have big companies like Carrefour or Walmart using it to that effect, but can also allow small producers to prove the, the, the quality uh, of the product, the origin of the product, and to negotiate fair prices. And so this is what Adel, um, uh, Abdel uh, Al Rahman was, was talking about when he was using it for, uh, for olive oil. Uh, and he was saying that uh, when uh, the, the producer was trying to, uh, just in Germany, there was very low visibility, which is a big issue in international trade. And that blockchain allowed those producers actually to show the value of the product, the quality of the product, that they met certain standards through the certification, um, and therefore uh, give them more power to negotiate a fair price. This traceability can also be interesting when it comes to uh, access to, to trade finance. As I said, there is a big trade finance gap. And uh, one of the reasons for this trade finance gap that particularly impacts small businesses is the fact that they don't have a credit history. Now, blockchain makes it possible for small businesses to create this credit history and so makes it easier for banks to assess the credit worthiness of small businesses. And in fact, there are uh, many use cases in the trade finance space uh, that use blockchain um, to, to facilitate uh, trade finance processes and make it easier for, for small businesses to, um, to, to, to uh, access trade, uh, trade finance, be it uh, to facilitate traditional trade finance processes like letters of credit, for example, where the use of blockchain has been shown to reduce the time needed to proceed um, uh, to finalize a letter of credit uh, transaction from seven to uh, 10 days to just a matter of hours or bid for new forms of trade finance, uh, in particular supply chain finance, with deep tier financing, which is possible because of the traceability dimension. So uh, this is a very important use case, traceability. But another very important use case when it comes to international trade is uh, the efficiency it can bring um, for supply chains and how it can um, make them um, or, or removing efficiencies from, from supply chains. Um, it all starts with digitizing trade documents. Um, and here, blockchain has very interesting characteristics, which is that it avoids the double spending issue. The fact that you cannot use, for example, a bill of lading, which is a critical document in international trade, twice for financing. And there were some big fraud scandals in Asia uh, where bills of lading had been used twice for financing. Now with blockchain, you have the guarantee that the bill of lading you have 
on the system is the authentic one, it's the original one. So from a fraud perspective, it's very interesting. And it can therefore uh, really supercharge uh, trade digitalization. But it's also very interesting because, as I said, there are many actors involved in international trade. And so when all these actors are connected to a single platform, they have the guarantee that uh, what, well, what you see is what I see. They see the information in real time and it can therefore remove many frictions. And there are a lot of uh, projects here again, um, not only in trade finance, but in logistics, for example, and DP World in, uh, in the UAE is using blockchain to, to that effect uh, to truly digitalize uh, supply chains. Customs are also uh, looking into it for their processes and in the Arab region, uh, the UAE and, and Morocco in particular are looking into it. Um, so there's a lot of activity in that space because blockchain can build trust between the different actors, solve the double spending issue, and therefore facilitate uh, trade processes. Great. It can also be used to automate processes through the use of, of smart contracts and therefore gains in inefficiency. So uh, quite a lot of opportunities that are, that are out there and the, the fact that it can make trade more efficient is important for small businesses. Why? Because they are the ones who suffer the most from burdensome uh, procedures um, because of their limited uh, capabilities. But uh, I would like to, um, to note that technology is only a tool. In order to truly make a difference, there is a need for more than just the technology. There needs to be the right ecosystem in place. And so what do we need for that? First, we need to raise awareness um, and knowledge about the technology, awareness about the opportunities that it can create, but also about the potential challenges that may arise. And uh, Ruby touched upon that. But there is also a need, uh, and I know there are some policymakers in the room, uh, to put in place the right legal framework. And this is particularly important when it comes to international trade to make it possible for companies, including small businesses, to benefit from the technology. And what do I mean here? There are two things that are critical. The first one is legislation on e-signatures. I did some homework yesterday, looked at who did what in the region. Some countries do have legislation on e-signatures, but actually quite a few do not. So I would invite, if there are policymakers in the room, please look into it and pass legislation on e-signatures to make it possible to truly move digital. The second thing that needs to happen is uh, to make it possible for um, documents of, of title like bills of lading to be uh, not only digitized but also uh, that these e-documents can be transferred across jurisdictions and recognized in the other jurisdictions. And here you, the UNC trial um, adopted a model law on, it's called <laughs> Model on Electronic Transferable Records, MELITAR, in August 2017. And it's a critical piece to make it possible to move digital for international trade and make it easier for small businesses to participate in international trade because it allows for recognitions of bills of lading. In the region, only two jurisdictions have adopted Melitar. Bahrain was actually the very first jurisdiction to adopt it worldwide, so congrats. And there's the Abu Dhabi global market also uh, that has adopted it. But so I really invite the, uh, the other uh, countries of the region to look into it because without that, it will be very difficult to use blockchain to its full potential for international trade. And last but not least, and I will finish with that, is um, the fact that it's critical to use open and global standards so that we, don't, we all speak the same language and we can exchange data from end to end, from one system to another. Now, we published uh, with the uh, International Chamber of Commerce uh, a standards toolkit that maps around 100 standards that are being used in international trade. And I, I really call on you whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're a policymaker to make use of these open and global standards uh, so that we, we build uh, synergies and we can truly exchange uh, data related to international trade from one system to another uh, much, uh, much more easily. Otherwise, we just create uh, other barriers. Uh, these interoperability issues interoperability issue, are, are really critical. Uh, so I will stop there just um, to, to summarize many opportunities that are out there uh, for, for companies, for governments, for small businesses. Um, but there's more than just the technology needed. Um, and so there's really a need to put in place the right um, legal framework. 
And uh, I've put here uh, on the slide, if you want to know more, uh, different publications that dive a bit deeper into these issues and a reference to an online course that um, I developed with the International Trade Center on uh, blockchain for trade, which is an introduction for SMEs, so for small businesses, to help them understand better what the technology is, what it can do, what it cannot do, because it's not a panacea either, um, and um, give, you, give SMEs some, some guidance as to how to, uh, to use or not this, uh, this technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Anuel, for sharing with us these different uh, opportunities related to world uh, trade. Maybe I can, uh, I can highlight two things that you mentioned. Uh, one of them is that blockchain does facilitate trading finance in terms of authenticating, authenticating transactions. And the other thing that it creates efficiencies in supply chains, which is the, through the concept of digitizing documents that normally are paper work right now. So digitizing this would definitely facilitate a lot. I, I want to actually um, highlight the idea that you actually created a, a training course for the ITC, the International Trade Center. And that's, that's actually amazing. And maybe I can highlight to some of the, the, the SMEs here in this room that ITC actually has a lot of open and public uh, information and courses that you can actually access quite easily. Any one of you, any SME who is thinking of exporting anywhere in the world can get a lot of valuable market intelligence from the ITC. So go, just Google ITC and you'll find classification based on different type of products a lot of information about who are the top countries that are actually importing these products, what are their needs, and it can give you some really, really cool information. So thank you for that, please. Yeah, maybe just to, to add that this uh, online course that we developed with the ITC is, is free of charge. So any of you can actually take it. Absolutely, so that, that's, the good, that's the beauty of ITC, that everything is free of charge. Now let me actually go back to something we were talking about, which is the metaverse. And I want to actually state this question to you and because for me it was actually quite interesting. I understand that any kind of new technology takes time to actually get developed. It needs to be, it takes time to get adopted. And there's always this typical technology cycle that we actually always have to go through. Now what was fascinating for me is that Facebook, or I should say actually Meta, lost 70% of its value in the last nine months. 25 of its value was lost in the last week alone. So yes, we have these disruptions in supply chains because of you know, the coronavirus. Yes, we have the war in, you know, between Ukraine and, and Russia. But it was actually fascinating for me to see the kind of report that came out of Meta just last week where investors were actually criticizing Mark Zuckerberg that he's investing too much in Metaverse and that he's not capable of seeing the kind of returns from this. And actually, I actually quote one of the uh, investors saying that Mark Zuckerberg should actually come back to reality and abandon this kind of distraction. So I wanted to ask you, Rudy, if you are an SME right now and you're thinking of see, utilizing this kind of metaverse technology, is this too early? What, what, what if I actually go into this kind of direction and I have the same fate that I'm having right now for Facebook. Like Facebook is a very deep pocket company. They can afford to do this. But what about the SMEs here in the Arab region? What, what kind of advice can you give them? Okay, uh, good question. Because I, I mentioned this, but also you have to take in the global economics that's happening in the world of not just uh, the war, uh, COVID, we just came out of COVID, the uh, international trade is actually disrupted. The whole supply chain is disrupted. Also, the social media aspect is actually being disrupted. Because why did, Meta, why did Facebook change to Meta? That's a big question. Because they saw that also that the social aspect of how they were growing is kind of, they reached a point of saturation. And that's why they wanted something new. They wanted to uh, change their topic. Now they're becoming more of a tech company, and this is where the trend is. But going back to the metaverse itself and losing a lot of value and then now being questioned by stakeholders and shareholders about should we go there? Should we invest more? Uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, Meta gave $10 billion for the research of, uh, of the metaverse. Now, this question is actually key because what's the right answer? We all don't know. 
So we are in a very early stages. But there's many things that we can know today as a building blocks for this. If you go back not long ago, seven years ago, AR and VR, they were a hype, right? And then they failed. And now they are back. Look at 2001. Who remembers Pocket PC from HP, if I'm not mistaken? Mm -hmm. It was too early. It failed. Seven years down the road, Apple created a product more or less similar, of course, much better specs, but in the same idea. But what they created was the marketplace that changed how things go. Look at Tesla. They created innovation beyond. We had cars in the 1920s and 30s based on batteries and electric. Why it didn't work there? There was a lot of politics, we understand. So sometimes it is about too early, sometimes it is about the politics, sometimes we are too far ahead, but what I'm sure for is the metaverse is here to stay. As I said in my statement, Facebook themselves don't know in the next year, in the next 10 years, where is actually okay. meta? Right. Is this meta, what we're talking about? I'll give a small example for me, where is one of the applications of the metaverse is going. If you go back um, not long ago, seven years, if you wanted to make a cross-country conference call, what did you need to do? If you had nothing, possibly you would invest around three, four hundred thousand dollars with top tech companies and so on. Fast forward to COVID times, we pay zero. Zoom gave us a utility that we te technically it's giving us for free. Zoom, Google Meet, and so on and so on. So we are still in early stages of anything today. But as far as our local region, and as far as the strategy that was put in uh, UAE in specific, because this is the most, not just in the region, the most advanced ecosystem, I would say, and the most advanced policies in the world of blockchain, metaverse, and so on, in the world. How can we also tap into their strategy one? How can we do our own strategy? There's a lot of things to invest and create on the infrastructure side for it to be mature within the next 10 years. There's okay. a lot of, and infra doesn't have to be hardware. Infra could be software, all right? So a lot of innovation we could put, but the real question similar to any uh, startup or similar to any entrepreneur, what are we trying to solve? Is okay. there a problem to solve? You know, I teach or I mentor, I mentored more than 200 startups in the last three years alone. Yep. Always they fail on defining their problem. What is the problem we're trying to solve? Where can we have a competitive advantage? How can we do a small MVP and not invest too much Very money good. to fail? Yep. And even failure brings lessons. Very I was good. there, everybody failed. I learned from my lessons. So how can we inspire? How can we start teaching? How can we, uh, if I remember, Tunis has a blockchain ecosystem and fund that started. Uh, George, uh, Egypt also they started with into something. We need more of these. Very good. Uh, Flat Six Lab, they were yep. here. Um, anybody from Flat Six yeah. Lab today yeah. here? Tell me, we would do. Yeah. So they should start into. This is one of the examples. They should start Thank into you. promoting those and moving forward. Uh, let me actually be specific about this, uh, and I'm going to uh, ask Asha about this. You know, you are working in the in the metaverse, the augmented reality, and the virtual reality space. If if you if there is one industry that you think that if, a, or one or two industries that you think SMEs here can perhaps focus on. You see an industry that you see a lot of potential where, you know, XR technology can be applied. Is it, is it about that you, they can start working in things related to changing the marketing experience of customers? How about the customer experience? Can they change the customer experience in different ways? Could it be possibly can, can how, about, how about things related to commerce? Can we do like X-commerce, ex extended commerce? What, what kind of advice? You, can you tell me specific areas that SMEs can focus on? My mic's not on, okay. Um, my biggest advice to, to SMEs particularly is, you know, with this kind of thing is don't adopt technology for the sake of it. Like that's really important. Don't just stop, adopt it because it's the hype word. As uh, Rudy mentioned, like, does it help you in solving the problem that your business is facing? We all know that SMEs don't have limited resources. So, um, you know, I would suggest 
if you can, maybe getting an advisor on your board who's a, a specific expert in XR or blockchain. People say they are metaverse experts, even though we know the metaverse doesn't exist yet, but we're all kind of you know, working towards it. Um, and and let, at, let them help you to deep dive into what your kind of growth trajectory is, what the problem is you're solving, what's your go to market. You know, does this technology actually have um, okay. a benefit to your business? Um, so that's my just kind of like SME generally. Um, don't, don't, don't just go buy virtual land, for example, and start a virtual store. You know, really? that's not the right strategy. You need to understand, a, you know, kind of the, the sector first. You have to understand the application specifically to what you're doing. Um, the, the areas where we see the, the biggest turnover right now is in media and entertainment and gaming. Um, the sector that we see the fastest growing, uh, in the UK anyway, is, is in healthcare. healthcare. There are tons of applications in, in healthcare. Um, it, it's actually led to a follow-on program from the Audience of the Future program that I mentioned before called Mindset. Um, so there's a specific challenge right now around um, building XR and health-related applications in the UK because it mm -hmm. is so big. The one tricky part about that is you know, adoption into particularly uh, national health services like in the UK. Um, it's a bit different in places in the U like in the US with private healthcare. Um, but you know, there's a lot of barriers to entry into healthcare and there's a lot of um, you know, different uh, things you need to adhere to policy-wise and, and restrictions. So we're trying to help the NHS with, you know, figure out that way to enable te immersive technologies to enter into the NHS in a more seamless manner and quicker, because usually it takes like five or six years to get into the NHS. So um, you know, it's, there's a whole bunch of right, different spaces. Right. Um, you know, I, I, every year we're seeing more and more sectors kind of adopting the technology and finding right. use cases for it. So I wouldn't say there's anything that's really excluded, but those are kind of the biggest ones. So you did mention healthcare is one of the sectors that you're, you're focusing on. It, yeah. And aside from the regular, the, the normal suspect, which is entertainment. Emmanuel, I think you want to add something here. Yes, yes, I would like, and I know we're running out of time, so I will, I will be very quick. I just wanted to give a, another perspective on that. Uh, using technology to solve a problem is fine, but I prefer to talk about it in terms of new opportunities. These technologies are still emerging, they're still developing. We don't know where they're going to lead us, but they truly open new opportunities. Absolutely. And so, for entrepreneurs in the room, think more in terms of what are the new opportunities that are out there? What can I do? What are the new services that I could develop? Um, there could be new ways of doing things in education. We mentioned it, uh, the, the first uh, immersive course that you attended. In terms of healthcare, indeed, uh, to, to train um, surgeons, for example, uh, instead of doing it in the real world, uh, you, you would okay. do it in the virtual world, but truly in an immersive way. For uh, You would be able to attend a concert, for example, a completely immersive concert. There are new services that can be developed um, using these technologies. And so I think it's very important for entrepreneurs in the room, if you're interested in these technologies, to keep abreast of developments, really understand what are the, the advantages, uh, the, the risks that they that can arise, but also what are the opportunities? How can they change business models? Yeah. So have a, a forward-looking um, view on, on these issues. Thanks. I remember one of, this, one of the things that going from a SaaS, which is software as a service, to virtual world as a service. That can be an area that some of our SMEs and entrepreneurs can look into, virtual world as a service. Thank you very much for that, Emmanuel. Now, since we're talking about SMEs and, and, and the startups, maybe I can ask uh, some of the audience if you have any questions. Uh, not, not a single one? Okay. All right, Karim. <laughs> All right. So I invite anyone who has any questions to please approach the uh, panelists after this uh, panel. And uh, I'm sure that we'll be very happy to answer any of the questions. He, I think we're running out of time, unfortunately. So, uh, but I invite you to definitely talk, talk to the panelists after this panel. I'm sure that you can find different ways to collaborate. With that, I want to thank again all the panelists once again, Rudy, Asha, and Manuel. And thank you again for attending this panel. And a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you.